Uh, of course, today, uh, I'll introduce Tom in a minute. I'm excited that he's here. I'm sure he's honored to have you guys here to show support and hear his story. But if you want to find us or Tom online, you can look at these <laughs> social handles, um, Tom Cox Design. And you can tweet something like this. I never knew how much I didn't know about brand identity. Thanks to Tom, my brand is now having an identity crisis. <laughs> Help. So anyway, something like that. It doesn't have to be exact, obviously. Um, all right. Without further ado, I want to introduce to you guys Tom Cox, who um, has kind of been a close colleague, but also a friend to our entire office for several years now, um, both professionally and personally. We've gotten to know him. Um, Tom spent nine years at Coca-Cola. Eight. Eight. Felt like nine. Yeah. Uh, he didn't say that either. Um, he uh, started out at Reinhardt and was fine, uh, majoring in fine art and then transitioned to UGA to focus on advertising. And so he's got a pretty fascinating background. Um, he's got a wife and two kids. He's been in Cherokee County for 20 years? 23. 23 years. Um, a lot of knowledge about brand identity, uh, design, graphic design, uh, even down to uh, language that's attached to a brand, like taglines and a, a brand story. And so I think you guys are going to love this story. We're going to try to pull out as much as we can today. Um, but for those of you who are brand new, we're going to do something we've never done before. Um, I'm going to let Tom explain it, but we're going to take maybe 10 minutes and do something that we've never done, and it'll explain the stuff that's at your seat, and then Tom and I will sit down and chat. Does that sound good? Yeah. All right, man. Good to me. Okay, so everybody has a Sharpie, some cards in front of you. They may not want it, but give okay. it a try. Does that this help? No? Yeah. Okay. Whoa, whoa, no. <laughs> Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay, so we're going to do a quick little exercise. Uh, and this is actually kind of part of the process I use with any new brand identity client that I sit down with. And that is we have to figure out what your brand is all about. Because in today's market, today's world, the people you're trying to reach have that long to make a decision. You've got to stand out, you've got to be focused, and you've got to be clear about what you're communicating. So this is kind of a take on some of the exercises that I use to help my clients figure out, okay, what's that focus, what's that message? So. Since everybody here either comes from a different brand or you're also you know, working on brands for people, I thought you can't do it for everybody. So let's just pick one brand that everybody knows or thinks they know and see what happens. So the brand today that we're gonna talk about is Coca-Cola. So what I would like for everyone to do, I'm gonna just take a couple minutes. I want you to write down three different words that you think best describes the brand, Coca-Cola. Don't share among yourselves yet. Keep it to yourself for now. We're going to see what happens here. And just to be clear, it's the brand Coke. It's the drink, not the company. It doesn't matter. Whatever you want to Are you going to play? I'm going to play. George. Can't not play. No, I have not seen the answers. Okay. Okay, everybody got three words? All right, so here's where the fun begins. Somebody tell me what you got. Red. Red? Good. All right, anybody else? Refreshing. Refreshing. 
Worldwide. Okay. Anybody else? Share. Sharing. Share. Sharing. Yeah. Yeah. Classic. 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 Okay. Sugar. Sugar. Fun. Fun. Active. Yeah. Anybody else? What do you got? Huh? Tradition. Tradition. Lovely. Yeah. Okay. Huh? Childhood. Childhood. Okay. What do you got, sir? Soda fun. Soda fun. What do you got, Ben? Cold. Cold. Okay. All right. So I took from the quote unquote official brand positioning statement, because this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to position the brand in the market. So the main words pulled from that are, it's a beverage. <laughs> it's not chewing gum. It's not, uh, you know, it's not anything. It's a beverage. It's worldwide, which means it's not all American because they're trying to reach everyone. Because, you know, China's a big market now, so all American won't work. But worldwide means diversity of who we're trying to reach. So those two are pretty just, you know, that's just kind of the framework for what they're doing. Where they get into how they communicate the brand is in the emotions, and that is Refreshment, which would go with cold. Rejuvenation. And enjoyment. Next time you see a Coke commercial, think about how much they're pushing enjoyment, rejuvenation, and refreshment. It's all about that. If it doesn't help that, they don't talk about it. That's what you have to remember when you're trying to apply this to your brand, to anybody else's brand, is that message has to be laser focused. Because like I said, people today only have that much time to make a decision. And we'll probably talk about it more later. It is an emotional decision. So that's it. All right, thank you, Tom. Sure. Appreciate that. Yeah. All right. <coughs> We're gonna try this one more time. Hello. Stay on. It's good time. Okay. So if you wouldn't mind holding this, yeah. and I'll just scream. <laughs> um, so I think it'd be good for us to um, maybe start off with a quick lightning round. Sure. That's cool. Sure. Um, this, this first one might be a little risky. Okay. I'm just going to ask a couple of lightning round questions. Just shoot from the hip, first thought. Sound good? Sure. Coke or Pepsi? Coke. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not being recorded. Tough okay. one. <laughs> uh, history or future? History. History. Digital or analog? Digital. Okay. In a battle between Superman and Batman, Superman. forgetting the movie. <laughs> Favorite decade of music? Huh. That's too tough for me. Uh, 30s to 80s? Favorite comfort food? Oh. Chocolate. Chocolate. Favorite. Uh, Trilogy, movie trilogy. Oh. Star Wars came to my first. Yeah. Mac or PC? Mac. All right, the last one is. Mac. Mac only. Okay. <laughs> like since 1989, only yeah. Mac. Really? <laughs> Today's lunch circuit is provided to you by Apple. Yeah. <laughs> Best decade for brand design. Decade. Um, probably. It's probably now. 
Really? Okay. All right. So jump in, Tom, and tell us a little bit about you, your family, your background for people who probably don't know. Uh, well, um, I was born and raised here in Georgia. I grew up in Alpharetta. Uh, as Jonathan said, I went to Reinhardt and then UGA, where I met my wife, Connie. And uh, we have two great kids. One has just graduated Georgia State, about to get his master's at UGA. And my daughter is about to start her college career at Mary. And they're both great kids, very talented, and um, both study finance and economics. Really? Yes. How did and you manage that? We're not sure because Connie was an art major as well. So we don't know what happened. <laughs> Maybe that's finance economics in response to it could art. Be, it could very well be a, the whole starving artist kind of thing. Subconscious decision to <laughs> have a more structured life. They're not here for testimony, are they? They're not. Right. That wasn't allowed. That's on purpose. <laughs> um, so you've lived in Cherokee County for twenty three years. Twenty three years. years. Yeah. So why why Cherokee County? Why Woodstock? And then why have you not moved? Um, well, to be honest, when we first moved here, we were, had been married about a year. Um, I was working already downtown at Coke. So we were looking something close to the highway for the commute and something we could afford. So Cherokee County offered that option for us at the time. And to be honest, we thought we'd be here a few years and then either move closer into Atlanta, or maybe more toward Alpharetta or whatever. But as time went along and kids came along, of course, all your plans go out the window. Uh, so we've been here ever since. And to be honest, since about 08, 09, when Woodstock started just kind of starting its boom, now it's like, we're actually now at a point now where we could move and we don't want to. So, Why is that? Is there well, one reason? Uh, I wouldn't know if there's one reason, per se. I mean, there's probably a lot of different reasons. Mainly, it's got everything we want, you know. I mean, it's got the entertainment, the restaurants, the, you know, family, friends. But, I mean, it's, it's not the dead little railroad town that it was <laughs> 10 years ago. Yeah. You know? right. so, so you've been here long enough to see that whole facade oh, yeah. change. Yes. For the better. Uh, yeah. 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 So what, what was your favorite restaurant in 2008 or 2009? Uh, what was our favorite restaurant? <laughs> it was nothing around here. Really? Yeah, nothing around here. Yeah. Back then. The, I mean, maybe Longhorn Chili's. Right. <laughs> franchise store. Yeah, franchise. Well, let's talk a little bit more like <clears throat> how you made it through some of your career. So, um, precursor to that, what, thinking back as a child, like what were you really good at um, growing up and maybe what were you not good at? Uh, I was good at getting in trouble. <laughs> I drew all the time, like everybody, every designer, every person who does this, that's their story. Including in class and everything, like doodling? Yeah, everywhere. Church, school, whatever, trips, yeah, all the time. So what were you not good at? Um, math. Finance. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Finance, Finance and economics. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> So I guess, like, thinking about well, that. let me just say Yeah, sure. Okay. In elementary school, there were several times that my teacher would separate me from the class. And one of them, he brought a refrigerator box to put over my desk to keep me separate from the class. But, like, my attention span was not there. Okay, so how many times did that happen? The refrigerator box. The refrigerator box, just once. Once, but several different teachers would separate me. So you're, the class is happening, the refrigerator box goes over your desk. Oh, yeah. What do you do when you're in the box? They dream. <laughs> <laughs> so at this point, she's not punishing you, she's enabling you. Well, yeah. 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 So do you accredit all of your, of your design success to that teacher? <laughs> sure, <laughs> That's interesting. My kids are homeschooled, so I'm going to have to uh, tell my wife that idea. Yeah. Just put them in boxes and let them go. You might get arrested now. <laughs> Um, okay, so t take that and then lead us up to professional career. So you leave UGA, yep. and then what are your plans? Where do you end up? Uh, my plans leaving UGA was that I was going to walk into the top advertising agencies in Atlanta, and they were just going to say, here's your corner office, 
you know, this is the format, but I was going to be Don Draper. That was my, I mean, I had it in my head, that's what I'm doing, that's what I'm going to be. I'm going to make TV commercials, you know, all that. And of course, several months later, no offers, nothing. People say, well, you should probably think about going back to school, get this, this, or this. And I'm like, I just paid for school, I can't do that. So I finally got a job at a uh, local uh, trade magazine publisher in a department that did all the promotion for the ad sales for their magazines. And we're talking glamorous magazines like Container News and uh, Air Cargo News, you know, that type of stuff. I mean, you know. Very trendy. Yes, I was so excited. But uh, so I worked there for two years, and that's actually where I learned uh, to use the Mac to, uh, for graphic software and all that stuff because came out of Georgia with no experience in that whatsoever. So this is, I graduated at the end of 89. So you're there for a couple years. Two years. And then what's next? Um, well, I think I told you before that um, I was making practically no money. I mean, it was very, very bad. I think my starting salary was 12500 a year. So it was, it was bad. We were engaged, about to get married. She was about to graduate. Um, and I was considering changing careers because I was like, this is not working. I can't, I can't get married and help provide for you know, my future family's life. So I started looking into uh, changing my career to sports management. And I wrote a letter to every major <laughs> baseball general manager in the country. Hand letter. Hand letter. Wrote it. They actually helped me address them. Uh, sent those out and just asking the question, I'm considering doing this. Do you have a school you recommend for a master's degree or do you have an opening? And I have a stack, this, still to this day this tall, of all the people who wrote me back from all these Major League Baseball teams with their you know, official letterhead. Um, most of them are written on a typewriter. Uh, and they gave me advice and said, you know, try this school or we don't have, or I got a form letter. Some of them were actually the, uh, I think I showed you at the time, I got a, the letter I got back from the New York Yankees. It was from Brian Cashman, who was now their general manager, but at the time he was like somebody's assistant assistant or something. And he wrote back a very just personal letter and said, here's what I would recommend, I'd die, good luck. So I was going down that road. And then I got the interview at Pitt. And everything changed. So there for eight years. Yep. And then, <clears throat> so there's an interesting story you've told that maybe not everybody here knows, but, um, and you might have seen it flash up actually, the Always Coca-Cola, yeah. the little always that goes over the top that we all know really well. Um, tell, us, tell us that story. Okay, so I've been, I was hired at Code because I knew the computer. And that's when they were transitioning all their files from actual artwork on a board to computer files. And so I got the job because I knew how to do that. Not because I was a designer or a great designer or anything like that. It was, you know how to do this. We need people, we need bodies to do that. So that's what I was hired to do. So a couple months into that, I hated it because I wasn't being creative. I was just recreating other people's artwork. So I kind of took the initiative to get to know the art directors and brand directors on the floor in the department and through that I realized they were, all the design work was being done by outside design firms. Um, so when I heard about this Always Coca-Cola campaign coming up and this project for the Always Coca-Cola logo, I just said to myself, I could do that. And so I stayed late one night, did a couple options, mounted them on a blackboard, snuck into the guy's office that was in charge of the project, I knew he had a presentation the next day to the higher-ups. And they had, he had a stack of blackboards probably this high on his desk because he had like two or three different design firms working on it. I slid mine in the middle. <laughs> next day he comes and goes, and actually overnight I started thinking, crap, he doesn't know that I did that. If they do pick one of mine, they're not going to know who did it. <laughs> so I went in the next morning, got there early, and when he got there I said, Sorry, I did this. If you want to take him out of the day, he's like, no, no, don't worry about it. Leave him in. We'll see what happens. So 
So he came back a couple hours later. He goes, "They picked yours." I so, mean, you're 23. Yeah. I mean, you must have been like spinning from excitement. I was pretty happy. <laughs> so, how many? Where? How far out did their agency reach go? Were they pulling people from Metro Atlanta and beyond? They pulled in people from all over the world. And they grabbed this 23. I don't know who specifically on that project, but they must have known. This is the guy that worked for the Container magazine. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they can tell. Yes. This is incredible. Yes. He understands packaging. Oh yeah. That's incredible. So it was a funny little, little, that logo was only supposed to be for the can. And because they had a whole separate ad agency working on the TV campaigns and the print ads, which they didn't even use that logo because they were already working separately from that. And so we put that always logo on the can, and then next thing you know, it's on other pieces of packaging, and then it's on point of sale, and then it just kind of took off. People grabbed it all over the world, and I think there's a slide that shows it in several different languages. It's, still out there all over the world we buy them. That's cool. So that obviously empowered you, right? But then you still end up... It showed me the value of initiative. But only survive another six or seven years ago. You couldn't... Yeah. Yeah. Is that the right way to phrase it? Survive? Yeah. There were good days and bad. Yeah. I mean, that's any corporation. Right. So you leave Coke, mm -hmm. and then you, where do you go? Uh, actually, uh, I've been in code for eight years and felt like it was time for a change. Looking back, I think I should have left after about five years, uh, just from where my career was at that point. But uh, we decided after we were pregnant with our, our daughter, and we were like, let's let code pay for that. <laughs> and so after she was born, uh, and everything was cool with her, uh, I just started putting my name out to recruiters, and I got recruited to uh, a dot-com company back in 2000 that was taking over the world, buying up all these little web design shops all over the world, and they had become a massive 14,000 employee worldwide company called March 1st. They did a Super Bowl ad. They had incredible office furniture and pool tables and game machines in the office and all the best. So I took the money, went there, and then realized they don't have clients yet. And never did. Ten months later, they shut their doors and I'm on the street with no severance, nothing. And no, a new baby. And a new baby, and no health care. Okay. So that's when my freelance really kicked in the high gear. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny because you guys probably know this, but as the, typically as the economy takes a downturn, yeah. entrepreneurship, rises and I don't know if you know this but a lot of when you spend a lot of your time in conversations with entrepreneurs you, you feel like everybody's an entrepreneur but when you look at the data um, startups are on the big decline right now um, despite you know co-working hubs and all these things popping up this is um, it has it's been on more of a decline now in the last than it has been the last 10 15 years and so um, so you're at a time where you're like you're desperate oh yeah so you walk into freelance Walk into freelance, and about six months in, we had lunch with some people that, from after church one day. And there was a new couple there, briefly spoke with him. He told me he was creative director somewhere, and I didn't really understand what he said. But he called me a couple of weeks later and said, um, Hey, I'm about to, I'm working on a, trying to get a catalog out. I know you're looking for freelance, would you be interested in helping? I was like, yeah, I'll take anything. So he was like, oh, and by the way, I'm putting in my two week notice. If you're interested, you could probably take the job after you know, I leave. And I'm like, this sounds promising. So I went, it was a company over in Kennesaw called Brigade Quartermasters. They've been around for 20 something years and they sold uh, tactical gear to the military and police and people who thought they were military police. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I went in, he left, they gave me the job, or offered me the job, and I said, I'll be glad to, to, to stay and take this job, but it, as part of that, I'm going to rebrand you. Because you they, tell them yeah, this. Yeah, I told them that, because they've been in business for 20 years. You know, they had done, they had, they had achieved, but what they had as a logo and brand identity, 
if anything was hurting them more than helping them. I mean, it was just something they pieced together over time. So they were like, was it the one with the gladiator on it or something like yeah. that? Yeah. It was a medieval archer, actually. Okay. <laughs> so I did actually an internal interview with everybody in the company. There's a hundred some employees. And the first question was, what is the logo? The owner was the only one who knew. So they agreed to let me change the brand there. You did everything. I did everything. Change the, uh, the logos, the tagline, the everything, catalog design, everything. Um, for about 10 years, they had been averaging around 20 million a year revenue. After we launched the brand identity within two years, it tripled. But that's the only thing that changed. And that was your first time doing a full day. That was my first time after leaving code doing totally on my own a brand identity. That told me this works. I can do it. I can do it for anybody. If I can do it for this company, I can do it for anybody. <laughs> and you're barely 30 ish. Yeah. yeah. That's pretty impressive. So, so at that point, you realize I'm on to something here. I'm on to something. I don't want to stay in a company. This conference room is called the Gun Room. Literally guns on yeah, the wall? Yeah, guns everywhere. Okay. Yeah. So I didn't want to pick anybody off. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, no, I just felt like it was time for me. If I'm going to do it, I need to do it now. So I left there uh, and actually retained them as a client on a retainer and started my own uh, thing in the Wow. So you've been doing this for a good while. I mean, 13 years plus. 13 years. So now you're an entrepreneur and have been for 13 years. Yep. Um, maybe tell it before we kind of jump into some questions maybe about brand identity and yeah. all that. Um, what do you feel like is the biggest win and maybe the biggest loss and what you might have learned from this? Well, obviously the biggest win is doing the identity for Fresh Start Cherokee in the circuit. I mean, come on. <laughs> yes. it goes without saying. Yeah. Um, I would say besides that, biggest win uh, has been uh, getting the redesign for Holiday Inn, uh, the hub at Holiday Inn. Um, and the way I got that is kind of a fun story. I had redone, I created a brand identity for a local barbecue restaurant in Marietta called Dave Post Barbecue. Um, and they didn't have a ton of money to spend, and it was, but they had they allowed me to create a free and trusted which that's a big deal for any designer, is the more you trust them, the better they will do. I mean, that's just, that's a fact. So anyway, he trusted me. I kind of went hog wild with his identity. <coughs> and he put it out in the store. His business started, you know, did really well. But shortly after we launched it, uh, the global brand director for Holiday Inn took his family there to eat. And he loved everything that was there, and he asked him, who does your brand identity? Yeah. And of course, Dave Poe goes, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> just Tom. Just Tom. Just Tom. No. Um, so fortunately, he gave me my phone number. He called me, came in, went through the whole song and dance of you know, talking to 14 different corporate VPs at Holiday Inn about coming on to help them with this new project where they were combining their cafe, their restaurant, and their bar all into one open lobby concept. So I didn't know this until about a year after we or after we finished the project, but they had interviewed me up against other bigger firms, not just one person in the firm. They had interviewed some of the top local restaurant design firms, you know, specifically targeted for that. And I got it. So it was a that was a big win for me. And that's the, the hub, if you guys want to see that fly through. Um, <clears throat> all right, take, so, oh, it's really hard for the question. so I wanted to ask about loss, but I figured you just wanted to gloss over that. Yeah, okay. uh, loss is... Uh, <clears throat> in terms of like business or business. Yeah. Um, well, I, there was one loss that turned into a positive comes to mind. Um, this was about four years ago, I think. Uh, actually, Brian Stockton contacted me. He's head of economic development at 
stuck. <laughs> you were his greatest loss. <laughs> yes. Since then. No, he, uh, he had met me through Reformation and asked me to come in and talk to him and his team about the green friends I did. And so went through that, met with his team and all that stuff. And that actually didn't work out. They went to someone else. And so I was kind of bummed because at that point, all I had was Reformation as a local client. And I never really thought the local clients as an option for making this work. Um, so that was kind of a bummer. But then, I don't know, six months, a year later, he called me to do the downtown Woodstock, I think, because he liked what he saw in the other you know, meetings. And so that's, that's how I got the downtown Woodstock meeting by not getting the green prints. Nice. Um, so. You guys seen the big uh, black W, right? Yep. With the railroad tracks, railroad tracks colored railroad tracks going around. Um, OK, so speak more specifically to brand identity. So okay. I think for a lot of us, we think of branding or brand identity. And the first thing that comes to mind is logo. <clears throat> logo design. Right. It's the same thing, right? Not the same thing. Um, just to be kind of clarifying, brand is the whole thing. Brand is the, the experience, the, the thoughts that the consumer has, the communication you put forward, it's the way it's customer service, it's all that combined. Um, as our friend Brad Banks likes to say, it's the why. Um, I like to say that brand identity is the why not. Because to me, brand identity is it's the front door to the store or the restaurant. It's the, it's the package sitting on the shelf that says, you need to try this. It makes a connection. And that's why I say, like in that quote you took from something I read on my website, that brand identity or brand value takes time because it's the accumulation of what you're building as a brand. Brand identity is instant. So like I said earlier, this whole exercise went through before people have that long to make a decision. You've got to be instant in helping them make that decision Three emotions. You're, I mean, you're basically graphically communicating. Graphically, emotions. with words. words. Um, to me, that's the, sometimes designers will forget about what they're actually saying in the design. So that's why I've always included words. That's part of my background as well. Yeah. <clears throat> so you, now, when you build a full brand, mm -hmm. It's, not, it's much bigger than just, <clears throat> here's colors, here's um, the design, here's the feel, it's, right. it's wording, it's terminology, right. it's language. Right. Um, and that, that's what you call a brand story. Yeah, well, to me, the brand story is, oh, I got really loud, didn't I? <laughs> Passion. The brand story. Uh, the brand story is, uh, it's more than a tagline. Kind of the, the foundation of who the brand is and how it connects with people. Uh, the whole brand identity is that, and the logos, and the other graphic elements, and the colors, and the typography, all of that working together to communicate. For lack of a better word, those four or three words that you're trying to communicate, you've got to get all that working together <coughs> to do it. And I, I mean, I think if I could say just personally, I think that's what part of what makes you good at what you do and valuable because <clears throat> it's more than just the graphic, the visual. <clears throat> so if you guys look on the wall here, excuse me, um, you see these three posters. It's part of our tagline for Fresh Start Cherokee, right? But what's interesting about the words dig, grind, and hatch, not only do they carry or capture this idea of a, an entrepreneur digging into their work and grinding out with ideas and then hatching out this idea, <clears throat> but he also brought in the history of our county. And so if you look at Dig, it's focused, you, could, you can't see it now, but it's focused with a poster on the gold mining industry yeah. here in Cherokee County back in the early 80s. That's what brought years. people here originally, yeah. And Other then, than the people who are not here, but it's right. that's a different story. <laughs> and then the grinding with the, the mills um, here in Cherokee County, which were a, a big part of our economy at one point. And then Hatch, um, I think at one point, 
The poultry capital. Poultry capital of the world at one point. Uh, right after, or during World War II, <coughs> post war. From what I've heard for research, there yeah. were the billboards when you entered Cherokee County. Really? So, I mean, I, my point there is it, it, <clears throat> there's obviously another skill set involved with going beyond just the visual and the design and bringing in this history and language. Where do you feel like that came from, Tom? I mean, how did you discover you were good at that? Um, I think it just developed as I was, I think it's probably part of my uh, studying at the EPA for advertising, because in advertising it is image and work together. But as you transition into just design focus, it's easy for a lot of designers to forget the whole picture. Yeah. So um, I think that's where it came from. And, and just to address this, one of the keys to me for any successful brand identity is being authentic to who you are, who the brand is. If you pretend to be something you're not, and you sell people with a brand identity, and then they get in to realize the brand is not what the brand identity said, lost them forever because they feel rejected or uh, slighted. Yeah. Uh, so to me that was part of saying, yes, this is Cherokee County, this is where we've come from, but this is where we're going. And that's, to me that's the whole idea behind a fresh start of Cherokee. So you have a, I've had a, a privilege and our team has had the privilege a couple times to sit in on a, um, I guess an idea session or mm -hmm. um, a brainstorming session that seems to be unique to Tom's design process, um, but without you know giving away too much of your cards, um, being in that process <clears throat> seems to be something that you've kind of made your niche, if you will. Um, how why is it important to have a process attached to your brand design and, and for the both for your your own identity as a brand, but also for your your client? Yeah. Um. Well, this is, I wouldn't say it's unique to me. A lot of designers and design firms have processes. They're probably, in the big picture, somewhat similar. This is just my process that I've developed over these 28 years. Um, and it's starting to cook. Um, you know, I, when people talking about cook, I say, well, it was my MBA branding because I learned from some of the top branding people all over the world. But I think there's an image in the Cherry Cook project um, just like a a lot of image boards of crazy looking like uh, you know everything from skaters and hip hop and all that stuff. So that's uh, I was working on the Cherry Go Brand in 1993, 94, somewhere in there. Um, and the the head of that project uh, was an incredibly smart brand marketing guy. He went to Yale. And, you know, he just smart. He was the first guy to ever say to me. Before you ever start doing anything, you need to get to know the consumer. And so we did this whole ethnographic study of teenagers around the world at that time. And so we, of course, we didn't have the internet. I had to go to these bookstores all around Atlanta to find magazines from all over the world that were targeting teenagers. So out of that, we pulled out these five different subcultures at the time. Grunge was one of the boards. So what we figured out was, Grunge is what we're, was in what we call the mall phase at the time. I don't know if you remember shopping malls that used to exist. <laughs> but uh, we figured if it was in the mall, it's already passe. Because people have already adopted it and it's, it's, it's on its way out. So the one the image in the middle, we call it industrial at the time because we didn't know what to call it. But you'll see there's people in there with tattoos and just all kind of crazy stuff going on, which this is the middle of the night, there's nobody had tattoos. Anymore. Now. I mean, so we figured out from that, or I realized, you can tell where things are going. So, to me, that's part of my process of every brand is to not only get to know the consumer, but get my clients to realize this isn't about them, the client, it's about the people you're trying to reach. Yeah. So, I have what I call my magic suitcase, which is pictures up here. So, I bring that into my client meetings are part of the process to get them involved um, for a couple different reasons. To let them know. One thing that I've also realized over the years working with clients is sometimes a lot of clients think they have to help me design something. <laughs> By going through this process, they get a creative outline, uh, you know, input 
by helping select my image board that kind of serves as my palette for the design work. So that's part of the, the uh, value of the process. And <clears throat> verbalizing those ideas out loud as, as a company, as a team helps. Yeah. Yeah, before, you've been through enough to know that before we did the magic suitcase, we did the whiteboard session with kind of the three word exercise type stuff. We dig even deeper than that. But uh, that helps me know who they are, who they think the brand is, and who the brand really is. Because if I'm working with a company, I like to pull people into those meetings that are not just the executive team. I want to pull in the people in the warehouse, the janitor, the low level, service person, because they all know the brand from a different point of view, yeah. and I need all that point of view, because that helps me get to the what's all day. So. so, being an entrepreneur and yes. having a home office, um, yes. but also a family, Yes. <clears throat> so what role or how do you feel like your wife, your two kids have shaped and motivated you as an entrepreneur? Um, well, there's no way in the world I could do any of this without my wife, because she takes care of everything else, period. <laughs> so there's no way in the world that I could do this. Now, I mean, the benefit is I have flexibility that I would have, you know, in a corporate position or whatever. But, um, yeah, as far as my wife, there's no way I could do it without her. And my kids, you know, they're just, they're my kids, I love them, you know. That's, I mean, I do it for her and for them. Yeah. Do you feel like there's uh, something you might have learned as an entrepreneur from your kids? Um, I think it's valuable to, just from a strict entrepreneur position, to be in a position where you can kind of dictate your own personal time better. It is good for helping and raising kids. Because I, I mean, you can ask my wife, when I was a coach, I was not involved as much as I should have been. Couldn't be. You know? I mean, I was either commuting for two hours a day, and I was working all hours, you know, just, you know, deadlines. Right. So, uh, so to me, that's the positive. Uh, and there's, I mean, that I can't, you know, my kids and my wife are my son, of course. You know, it's like, hey, look at this, what do you see? If I show you this, what does it look like? You know, there's nothing better than a kid's reaction to tell you right away. <laughs> it's hard to ask. Well, they just, you know, <clears throat> does this look like, uh, does this look like a beer bottle? No, it looks like a giraffe. You know, I mean, <laughs> it's going to be that quick. And I don't feel that big. Yeah, well, I mean, it's good to you know. Yeah. Um, I heard a guy say something about his, um, how his wife views him, you know, when it comes to like his work or his passion, and he said that nobody's more proud of him than his wife, but she's also not not impressed. Yes, and I feel like that's a good, that's a good balance. <laughs> like she knows the real you, she knows you're gifted. She nobody would support more, but she's also like, all right. There's plenty of times that I show her something, she's like, no, I'm not doing it. Honest feedback, right? Yeah. Um, well, there's a there's hundred more questions I could think of, and there's another 12 on my page, and we don't have time, so. Okay. Uh, I want to turn it over to you guys. We've got 15 minutes or so, or less. Um, so if you have a question on anything, um, just shout it out, and we'll try to get hey, time. Hey, can I have one minute before sure. we do that? I brought some notes, and this is just to share with uh, entrepreneurs that I feel like it's something that really, it's just, my experience for 28 years, and I think it, I probably, people, designers who know me have asked me to write a book, which I haven't had anywhere near the time to even do that yet, but I just thought I'd share these with you today, hopefully they help you. But uh, the first one is, if you're, a, if you're a startup or an entrepreneur or running a small company, your logo is not your baby. It is not your child. It is just a graphic that either you created yourself or somebody created it for you just to get the business going. If you didn't hire a professional designer to help you with it, it might be hurting you more than it's helping you. It is not, it should not be an emotional attachment for you. It should be an emotional attachment for your customer. 
but that's one quick one. Um, what was that? Um, if you have a business problem that you're trying to solve, it is going to be way better to have a designer on the front end of the problem than at the back end. Traditionally, people, you know, they get in the conference room and they go, we've got this problem in sales or this problem in customer service or whatever, and they kind of figure out what they're going to do, and then they go, at the tail end, they go, oh, we need a designer to put them all together. Well, the designer, the strength of the designer, anybody created, is their uh, capacity for empathy. Designers always put themselves, or should always put themselves in the other person's shoes and think, how do we help this person solve that problem? So, uh, one really great example of that is Apple. You know, Steve Jobs brought designers to the front end when he came back to Apple, and it changed the company forever. So, um, also, if you're an entrepreneur and you're um, doing a startup and you're creating a brand identity or anything like that, nobody cares about your favorite color. <laughs> what you should care about is who is what is your customer's favorite color and what does that color communicate. So, um, I uh, kind of mentioned this earlier, but it's not what or how it looks, but why it looks. Certainly. So this is this goes back to what I mentioned earlier about emotions, but uh, I found this interesting. I actually recently found this out that there's a neuroscientist at, at USC. For the um, the institute that created the cure polio. Anyway, he's a salt institute. He's a brilliant neuroscientist. He studies uh, the brain, and he's worked with people who have had brain injuries to the parts of the brain that control emotions. And what they've discovered is that's the only part of the brain that's had injury. These people can still think logically, and they can function in all ways except they have no control or they don't have emotions. They can't make decisions. So he has done further study and concluded you have to have emo emotions in a critical part of any decision. So to me that just validates even more. That emotional connection is so valuable for a brand or business or anything. Um, the consumer dec decides. Yeah, it's emotional. an emotional decision. Yeah. And you know, if you look at the basic emotions, it's fear, anger, you know, that kind of stuff. But it's also surprise and joy and anticipation and trust. Right. That's what I'm trying to get with every brand I do. I want to be free of anticipation, trust. Maybe a little bit of pleasant surprise and joy. That's good. So, you know, yeah, that's just great. Yeah, thanks for going through that. That's sure. good. All right, what questions do you guys have? So, I got one. Uh, if you if you're successful three out of every ten times as a baseball player, you're going to be at the All Star game. Yeah. You come up with all these different ideas. How do you get emotionally attached to the fact that? Okay, I'm going to design, what, what's your success rate, so to speak? Is it one out of ten? Is it one out of five? And how do you kind of step into that emotionally where you go, okay, I'm going to come up with eight ideas today, and they're going to get shot down. How do you kind of temper yourself with the failure side, whatever, sure. whatever your business is? Yeah. Um, my goal is to bet a thousand. to a client that I've created. A lot of designers, a lot of like what I would call master designers, huge firms, 
firms. They will come in with one solution because they, you know, they feel like they've been hired to come up with the solution and they, they present that. I usually include more options just because I still have a feel figuring, helping the client figure out what is the best direction. So I like to include them like I do with the image board in the process. Um, but if I show them three or four or five options, they're not seeing the literally 20, 30 other options that I've already gone through actually on screen um, that I've already weeded out myself and said, this won't work because that will never work on a sign or a package or whatever, or it doesn't communicate quick enough. Um, so I also think there's other factors that I've learned over the years. Of, you know, once something is implemented, um, whether total success or failure, it's not always independently up to that. Um, like I mentioned earlier with the brigade thing, I can I would never say it was totally brand identity that helped them increase revenue. There were other factors, but I know that it helped. So Another touch point. 
I mean, it's, it's definitely something I have to be aware of and think through and think how can I produce an identity that's going to work well on social media, whether it's the small profile picture, the larger cover images, or if they're using it, you know, in a promotion on post and that type of stuff. Um, so, to me, it's, it's, it's social media is replacing the print ad. It's replacing the catalog, it's, you know, that type of stuff. But to me, it's still, how do you communicate that brand, brand identity, no matter whether it's a, a truck with a vehicle wrap or an Instagram post? I don't know if that answered. Yeah, I'm just curious as you thought. Yeah. Do you find, like, you spend more time on Instagram than you would, like, on Twitter? For me, personally? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. But it, it varies for clients. If I'm doing, thinking about it for a client, I have to figure out where they most active. Right. And maybe where should they be more active? Okay. What other? Kind of, there's a question here in the middle. Yeah, looking by yourself, if you get creatively stuck, do you have people you bounce ideas off of? Or? Yeah, I have people that I've worked with for years. I have one guy that helped me found Small Town Creatives, and he actually used to work for me in Brigade. Um, but he's an illustrator, and he lives in Canton, and we Skype almost daily, like we're in the next cube each other, because that's we were <laughs> at one point. We were just, so sometimes we'll like call each other and say, hey, what do you think of this? Or we'll just call and talk about whatever TV shows we've been watching while we work. You know, so it kind of helps with the solitude. That's true. I mean, your, your basement office is large enough. You could probably build him a <laughs> yeah. section. Yeah, probably. Don't tell him that. OK. So you don't design so many things that are like globally recognized. Is it weird to see your work like in random places? Like, and is that a shock that you've done so many times with like, the whole search thing came back? And yeah. Uh, that? Can you repeat the question? Oh, yeah. He said that done so much stuff that's global and out in the world and how do I feel when I see it, you know. Um, I don't know, I, people ask me that because, I mean, it, you know, it's a good feeling to see it actually in the market, but to me it's, I mean, it's, it's like, well, I expected it to see it in the market because I did it for it to be in the market. And sometimes I see stuff and go, eh, it shouldn't have been that way. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, it could have been a little bit different or whatever. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard. Most designers are their own worst critic. So it's hard to look at something and say, oh, I wish I had I mean, that W just a little bit thinner. <laughs> yeah. Right. So. <laughs> There's another question here in the middle. Yeah. For a nonprofit or a small business with limited resources, you talk a lot about you know, the importance of brand identity. Yep. Where, where do you suggest an entity like that begin, or where can they focus when they you know, don't want to I'm so glad you asked that because my personal opinion is if you're starting a, a nonprofit, small business, anything, and you do not have a budget or funding to bring in a designer, if you have a name of the entity or the brand or whatever, just do a simple work mark. Just do something extremely simple. Don't try to figure out a logo that explains everything. Keep it simple because people are going to build meaning into it. If you keep it simple to start with, when you do have a budget to bring in a designer, you can start with that very so much easier than having to retrain people from something that might not be as good as it could be. So. Are you aware of a resource? I've used logo beans and some sites like that. I mean, if you, what's your opinion on something like that? <laughs> so, I just you want, you want, so okay. what do you do? I have an insurance agent. Okay, so if if someone could just go online and buy insurance without calling you, how would you like it? Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I know that's the trend, and it's, uh, if you got on designer message boards, it's not pretty <laughs> when you hear about those type places because 
you know, those people aren't putting any thought into who you are in reality and who your customer is. They're taking what little you give them and saying, oh, I don't know, you sell shoes, let's do a shoe logo. And that may not be what you need, really. It may be you know, something more targeted. That's good. Probably have time for one last question. Yes, ma'am. Do you have a So in typical fashion, we try to announce uh, next month at the, the current one so that you guys can kind of know exclusively who we're going to talk to. We're pretty excited. Um, on August 8th, so mark that on your calendar if you guys want to. Uh, it's always Typically, it's always the second Wednesday of the month from 1130 to 1 here at the circuit. And so next month, we're going to feature a guy named Ashley Holcomb. Um, so some of you may know him, some of you may not. He's a serial entrepreneur. He's a Cherokee County native. I believe he was a ball ground councilman for 10 years? Like I'm looking at Misty, but I think he started when he was pretty young. 22. 22 as a councilman for the city of ball ground. Um, he's a member of our board and has been for almost eight years now. Um, he's been a, a tremendous value to the community and the Cherokee County. He's been very instrumental in helping us build our Cherokee 75 corporate park out on 92, if you guys haven't seen that, where an Alpha and uh, Adidas are located. Just done all kinds of stuff, and he's so young. I mean, he's like 44 or 45. He's got five kids or maybe 10. I can't keep up. Um, he's a family man. He does incredible work. So he's also an interesting storyteller. So um, just like Tom and others in the past, we try to bring people that have learned so much about entrepreneurship, and they're willing to tell their story and what they've learned. So if you guys... Um, Use this code here, Ashley underscore H. You can get $5 off your tickets for next time. Um, that starts today. So go ahead and um, pre-register if you can. That code will last one week from today. So now's your chance. There's the link. I can leave it there if you want to take a picture. Um, grab some stickers of Tom's before you go. Grab some business cards. They're really cool. Take those with you. And uh, you guys feel free to enjoy yourself and speak to Tom when you're done. Thank you all again for everything. We really appreciate it.